Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to celebrate the launch of Rehearsals for Living, a new book by Robin Maynard and Leanne Simpson. My name is Naomi Murakawa, and I'm moderating this conversation from Hopewell, New Jersey, land of the Lene Lenape people. I'm also the editor of the Abolitionist Papers series here at Haymarket Books. And I'm so proud to say that Rehearsals for Living is part of the Abolitionist Papers series, and in fact, the third release, along with Miriam Caba's We Do This Till We Free Us, and Abolition Feminism Now by Angela Davis, Gina Dent, Erica Miners, and Beth Ritchie. How can I introduce you to Rehearsals for Living? One way is to say that it's a collection of letters between two luminous activist scholars working from distinct but overlapping indigenous and black radical traditions. Robert Maynard, author of Policing Black Lives, State Violence in Canada from Slavery to Present, and Leanne Simpson, artist, musician, author of several books, including As We Have Always Done, Indigenous Freedom Through Radical Resistance. But this book is much more than a set of exchanges between intellectuals who are armored up with studies and theories. It's actually an invitation to vulnerability, to let go of that armor in recognition that this world is ending. And beyond that, this social order is not salvageable and in fact, not worth saving. This book is essential reading and I think it's essential reading for abolition. In Abolition Feminism Now, Davis, Dent, Miners, and Ritchie warn us that, quote, US-centric discourses and organizing can saturate contemporary abolitionist political movements, reinforcing and potentially alighting local histories of violence and resistance. Thus, internationalist engagements are imperative to illustrate the continuing and global repercussions of colonialism and imperialism embedded in police and carceral institutions." Close quote. Um, I also think this book should be required reading for anyone who considers it a form of protest to say, if Trump wins again, I'm moving to Canada, as if Canada as a nation state where some kind of mild-mannered liberal utopia somehow exempt from the racist settler colonial project. As this book teaches us, the elsewhere isn't Canada. The elsewhere might not even be a place yet. Perhaps the elsewhere is what we practice, it's what we build, and we can do that with and through rehearsals for living. Leanne and Robin, I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, this book is both prose and poetry, and I want to lean into the, um, the poetry of it by beginning with readings from the book. Um, I wanted to start, Robin, by asking you to read um, a portion of the first letter to Leanne. Thank you so much, Naomi. I'm writing you a letter at the end of this world. From Cyclone Ida in Malawi, Mozambique and Zimbabwe, to Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas, the devastating forest fires displacing indigenous communities from the Amazon rainforest through to the Mishkogamang Ojibwe Nation in northern, Northwest Ontario, our respective communities, that is, black and indigenous communities, are collectively positioned on the very forefront of the unfolding catastrophe. It would require a deliberate obfuscation to view the racially uneven distribution of harms that the climate collapse engenders as accidental. Even if we didn't take into account the melting of Arctic ice caps, rising seawaters, the eroded shorelines, desertification and species extinction that are now nearly, if not totally inevitable. The reality is that not only are an array of world endings already before us, they have already arrived. Our respective communities have borne already multiple apocalypses that were inflicted upon us, if unidentically, from the barbarity time of genocide, slavery, settler colonialism. The apocalypse is imagined, after all, in most classic Euro-Western settler tropes, in terms of the lack of clean drinking water, the destruction of the places we, they, live, the poisoning of the earth, 
inhumane and restrictive responses to people left hungry, displaced, in desperation. This is a condition that is already deeply familiar to our kin across Turtle Island and globally. You wrote about this in Dancing on our Turtle's Back. In your words, by 1822, when many Anishinaabeg in the North and West were still living as they always had, we were facing the complete political, cultural, and social collapse of everything we had ever known. My ancestors resisted and survived what must have seemed like an apocalyptic reality of occupation and subjugation in a context where they had few choices. To remix public enemy, Armageddon been in effect. It is the apocalypses of slavery and settler colonialism that bind our collective pasts and presents together in the calamity at hand. Today, the racially uneven environmental catastrophes of the present are inextricably connected to the unfinished catastrophes of 1492, the two genocides at the heart of the Americas, to paraphrase M. Norbessi Philip, when a death-making commitment to extraction and dispossession took hold on a global scale. In this burgeoning global logic and political economy, our ancestors became, through distinct but interrelated processes, what Cedric J. Robinson once described as a collection of things of convenience for use and or eradication. The factory of post-apocalyptic life that has unfolded its dramas over the last half millennium means that our collective histories are mapped out to onto the racially and geographically differentiated vulnerabilities amidst the present future disaster. As we are confronted with the crisis of the Earth's viability then amidst so many crises, I'm writing you so we can think together about what it means for us to live, to build livable lives together in the wreckage. As I write you from the, from the end of this world, I'm also very aware of both of our respective, if unidentical, subject positions as domestic enemies of and inside the settler state, and of our presence within one of the main arteries of Western empire. I'm writing to you from the belly of the beast. Despite its pretensions of being a benevolent nation state, Canada plays an important role in the massive carbon unloading and the ecological and human devastation wrought by extractive industries. These industries produce over 50% of the world's carbon emissions, not to mention the cataclysmic environmental devastation of the tar sands pipelines that run through more than 350 Indigenous nations in so-called Canada alone. Much of the unmaking of Black and Indigenous lives and the ecosystems that have historically sustained our lives, spanning Turtle Island, the Caribbean, Africa, and South and Central America, can be traced right back here. Thank you, Robin. Um, so the book begins at the end, um, and it actually begins with a, the sort of Cole that I think many of us are used to reading, which is um, a, a, a doomsday prediction that is meant to sort of terrify readers into action. But that's not actually what's happening in this book, and that's not what the presentation of the end um, is meant to do as the initiation of this exchange of letters. So I wanted to ask both of you to comment on why begin at the end? Um, or perhaps more to the point, what are the reference points and resources that come up for you um, to acknowledge the end of this world? It was beautiful to hear Robin read that, that first letter to me again after going through this amazing editing and, and, and publishing process. And I was thinking back to the time when Robin would have been writing that letter and in the fall of 2019 um, and getting that first letter and feeling like it was an invitation, feeling like um, I, was, I was engaged right from the beginning, right from the first line I knew I was going to write back and I knew it was gonna take me a while to um, do the work to to write back um, with the same energy and intellect that Robin had gifted me. And so I loved that 
immediately right off the bat, Robin was feeling like we're at the end of this world, but then reminding us of this long history of resistance by the black community, by the indigenous community, and reminding me to think outside of my own individual experience and think globally, think about the world, think about how at every point since we developed and, and inherited these systems that were created by a very few to benefit and comfort and um, and create wealth for the very few, um, we've had constant world endings. And so I felt like the letter was a beginning in the present. Um, it was situating the thinking in this long history of, of resistance. And it was so focused on how we are going to live together and how we dream and practice and make elsewhere and otherwise. Yeah, I think to me, beginning at the end is also thinking about for how long we have been beginning from the, from world endings, thinking about how our ancestors have survived multiple world endings already. You can't think about the kidnapping of 15 million Africans from the shores of West Africa, the total environmental and human devastation of indigenous genocide and the environmental destruction as anything but world endings. But at the same time, you know, Europeans built a new world on top of us at that time with stolen labor and stolen land. And this is a world that was premised on a violently enforced, on violently enforced hierarchies along race, gender, uh, class, a land dispossession and expropriation of lands, labor and life. A world where inequality globally is held in place by the logics of racial capitalism, where the carceral arms of nation states, police, prisons and border controls are enforcing the ongoing theft of land and labor and life. Um, you know, as we have this increased, the increased droughts and hurricanes, black people being slaughtered in the streets and in their homes, and indigenous land defenders arrested for defending their homelands. Something that it was important for me to sit with too, was that there are some world endings that I'm comfortable with, that I'm comfortable with the end of the world white supremacy built, that I'm comfortable with the end of the world racial capitalism built, racial capitalism built, and thinking about all the other kinds of world makings that had been partially eclipsed, but never quite, right? That where we saw these continual ongoing insistences that we could build forms of organizing life and land otherwise, to think with Ruth Wilson Gilmore, wherever life is precious, life is precious. So I think it's helpful to remember that worlds that have been unmade can be remade anew, and that also that the kinds of world that have been imposed on us uh, can be overturned and overturned again as we try to create a more livable kind of, of, of planet in the future as we're up against the climate catastrophe and so many other crises. So it was trying to stay attuned to the fact that people are building more livable worlds all the time. And it's not for the first time and 2020 wasn't the first year, uh, even if the media had its reckoning at that, at that moment. I think what was such a revelation for me is that, you know, there were some of the facts being presented that are not new, but there's an, a different emotional tenor, a different, which is a way of saying this, this is not pessimism. Right? The claim being put forward and the analysis put forward and just the ethos of it is not, it's always been this way, it's always going to be this way, we can't do much to change it. It actually begins from, um, I think, with a rejection of a kind of pessimism, even as it is acknowledging this world is ending. Up to you if you want to comment on pessimism. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, uh, one of the things, one of the things that, I mean, Miriam Cabot reminds all of us, and I think that the words hope is a discipline coming up over and over being repeated probably daily in households and communities is something that really matters because I think it's about um, not accepting the status quo as inevitable, right? And not thinking about the world that we, not taking for granted that, you know, that this was choices that particular people uh, made to impose a certain kind of violent order upon the world and remembering that things that have been, again, undone can be done, undone and remade. So something that I think is really valuable that helps me not become a pessimist, even though I'm very cynical about, you know, the political will of institutions, for example, of police or government leaders to change themselves, 
is to remember that people are building these livable worlds all the time. And looking at the historic Black-led protests of 2020 in the streets of Toronto, all throughout the United States, the hunger strikes behind bars, the way that people came together to support uh, community members living in intent-based in encampments, right? That shows that even in a time of despair of a global pandemic that was taking life and taking life very unevenly um, within Black and Indigenous communities, you also saw an incredible outpouring of love and community building and a refusal of the logics of disposability. And I think that even though, uh, of course, the corporate media is not attuned to this, there are vastly more people living today that would rather see uh, a survivable planet for uh, the, the next generation and for their loved ones, right? That um, that there are these visions for the future that are not being represented to us as the majority, but nonetheless, we continue to see a really strong support for uh, visions of otherwise that are being mapped out, even as political leaders continue to just sort of eclipse them and sell us back the smallest scale reform or, um, you know, different kinds of cloth around their neck, for example, in the photo ops. But I think that our visions are so much more expansive than that. And 2020 showed us that in this moment, but I think that we can look back throughout throughout history and we can always see our enslaved ancestors, ancestors running away. You know, that there's always been projection disorder. to be something that's incredibly powerful. I think for me, I was I was thinking alongside um, my ancestors. I was thinking about how they lived. I was thinking about how they got up every day and they they engaged in in practices to make their political system, to make their ethics, to to make their their legal system, to figure out how to live in deep relationality with the plants and the animals and the other forms of life that they were sharing time and space with. And so I liked this idea of practices. And when I started to think and feel and live um, in little pockets like that, I started to see different iterations of the idea of coming together um, in real time, organizing communally to meet the material needs of, of communities. Now, whether that's indigenous land-based practices, whether that's organizing in protest, um, whether that's that's music, whether that's coming together around a kitchen table, um, all of all of those different um, iterations are sites of knowledge generation, and they're sites of relationship building. And so I think I saw reflected back to me when I started to listen in a different register. Um, I saw black people, I saw indigenous people coming together, solving problems, dreaming refusing but refusing in a generative way and so that was i think um very transformative to me and it made me extremely pessimistic around the idea of reforming racial capitalism reforming the nation state reforming policing negotiating begging the settler state to respect my rights or or um or trying to be in dialogue with them um, but really cherishing the precious embodied teachings that I think um, were being demonstrated to me. Leanne, I, I wanted to ask you to go deeper into some of those, um, those precious embodied lessons, as you say, by reading us um, a longer section from the book. This comes from um, one of the middle letters, um, a passage on home and homelessness, um, starting on page 135. Sure, so at the beginning of this section, I'm thinking alongside Fred Moten and um, his discussion of, of homelessness and home spaces. I start to talk a lot about the ethics and the politics of, of sharing within Anishinaabe and, and Dene political practices and uh, then um, I start to share, I guess, with first with Robin and, and now with um, with readers, how I'm feeling about that, uh, that sharing. Sometimes in the face of five centuries of viciousness and violence in return, I feel ashamed of sharing, as if not sharing and not caring for, as if eliminating the first invaders and colonizers would have stopped colonialism. It would be easy, particularly in the logic of colonialism, to frame sharing as 
naivety and a not knowing, as is often done with regard to the native, even sometimes in the more radical indigenous circles that travel within my mind and in my work. Returning to Moten, I am hearing him say, home is never just your home. It is not an enclosure. It is not property with a picket fence and a guard dog. It is a space created by relationality, constantly visited by insects, mice, squirrels, bears, spirits, winds and rain, plants and medicines, and this visiting forms the network that is the container of home. So yes, we are homeless, not in the sense that we don't have a house, but in the sense that homelessness is, in Moten's words, quote, a condition in which you share your house, in which you give your house away constantly as a practice of hospitality. When practiced collectively, this builds the most beautiful responsive formation, continually being remade and morphing to meet the needs of individual beings. There are requirements, however, for this to work. Requirements that the viciousness, Moten uses this word and it resonates with me, of white supremacy in the practice of colonialism refuse to fulfill. And so, as the old metaphor goes, the settler moves into the indigenous home, confines us to a closet, and proceeds to take ownership over the house, building a picket fence, acquiring a guard dog, and security system. Ah, so in our practice of kindness and sharing and deep care, we will clearly outline our expectations. We will agree to share the space, take care of the space and respect each other's decision-making processes, working diplomatically to negotiate solutions to conflict. We will enter into a treaty relationship, to be clear. I'm drawn to the way Moten uses the term homelessness as a refusal of homelessness in one sense, as an assertion of homelessness in another sense, and then finally as a remaking of what homelessness or home space means as conceptualized by Black people. I use terms like self-determination and nation as a way of pushing back against the state and the forces of dispossession as a refusal of state definitions and Western political definitions and an assertion and remaking of those terms based in Indigenous thought. Similarly, I use the word nation both as a pushback against colonial understandings of the word and as a way of affirming indigenous collective and relational formations as legitimate, more legitimate, I argue, than settler nation state formations. It is possible in Nishnabek understandings to hold sovereignty and jurisdiction over land while also affirming the sovereignty and jurisdiction and self-determination of others on the same space. And this requires an intense, intimate and ongoing relationality and shared political understanding. In my mind, this idea of homelessness, to come back to Moten's term, also extends to territory and nation. Nishnabe think of our nation as a home or home space. I understand Nishnabek nationhood to be a formation of deep relationality with all of the communities of living beings sharing a particular time and space for their placemaking. It is a network cycling through time, a web of intimate connections where bodies are hubs forming vital pathways and links between plants, animals, rivers, lakes, the cosmos and humans blurring the boundaries between body and individual in favor of interdependent communal systems. Indeed, the spirits of living beings are believed to transcend the enclosures of bodies and commingle in realms other than the physicality of the earth. Our home space is an ecology of relationships in the absence of coercion, hierarchy, or authoritarian power. Thank you for that, Leanne. I, I just have to say, for, for me, one of the sustained revelations of this book was um, reading about the difference between nation and nation state and the really um, fierce ways of separating sovereignty 
and dignity, which must be maintained and respected, but thinking of a sovereignty that is separate from property and ownership. Um, and I, I just thought this was one of the most amazing sustained um, conversations moving through the letters. And I just wanted to prompt you, maybe Robin, I'll ask you to jump in um, with some of your responses and how um, you interpreted Leanne's letter. And just to ask you both more generally, um, a, a passage you quote both repeatedly is Ruth Wilson Gilmore's Freedom is a Place. And I wanted to hear a bit more about what that means to you. Thank you. I think the idea about thinking about freedom as a place, but not a place that we own, is something that really come, came through to me so powerfully when I first read Leanne's letter and so much through her work. So what she's reading from, uh, you know, as you know, is a section of the book of the letters that are called 100 Forms of Home Space. When we're thinking about home space in the text, we're thinking about different Black and Indigenous histories of trying to uh, find freedom and justice and liberation in the places that they live um, that have often come through the articulation of black, nat black nationalism and internationalism. Leanne writes extensively about, you know, indigenous histories of nationalism and internationalism and self-determination in ways that are not identical to or reducible to the nation state in many instances, but not in the European Westphalian vision of that. And I think that there can often be sometimes on part in some parts of the left, a way of flattening history a way of looking at black anti-colonial, anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist struggle as a desire to solely have black heads of state in an, in an unjust world, right? Black leadership and autonomy and uh, within the hierarchical structure. And of course, you know, I'm very much thinking with Adam Getachew and William C. Anderson here in terms of trying to take up some of the ways that home space has been imagined, uh, sometimes through the invocation of nation and sometimes not, where people have tried to dream up other ways of organizing life and land and relationships, often doing so, you know, in some periods in history under the terms of the national, but again, with nation meaning something quite different. I think if we look to Claudia Jones and she's, I'm trying to take up some of these freedom dreams of the ways that black people imagined home differently. And when she was trying to think about what the West Indian Federation could be, not as it was, but what she was struggling towards was this black feminist understanding of a possible Caribbean home space based on socialist ideas, based on ending the exploitation of women, based on freedom of movement that, of course, is very different than the reality now where we're, ha where we're seeing, for example, Haitians deported from Bahamas and all of these ways in which we have not actually actualized freedom in that way. But I think it's important to look at when the, the many times that Black people have tried to, to create these kinds of home space under the, the sort of forced adaptation of nation state that happened, uh, this was assassinated, right? That imperialism assassinated these possibilities before they would come to be from Congo uh, to Grenada to Haiti, that these other ways of organizing land and space um, were, you know, continue to be assassinated by the U.S., by Britain, by Canada. And in the world, the words of Alexis Pauline Gums, uh, a home controlled by black people who refuse capitalism is a dream that's too dangerous for reality. But um, I think what we were trying to do is articulate an affinity and a shared politic and a way of relating to one another, to our communities, to land outside of capitalism, outside of enclosure, and outside of ownership that aren't necessarily linked to leadership within the really bureaucratic and hierarchical structure of the nation state and not thinking about this formulation as historically inevitable and particularly not as something that needs to endure uh, permanently given that, you know, given the ongoing realities of neocolonialism, it has not been a container for Black people's freedom dreams, particularly for, you know, Indigenous uh, the many indigenous nations that were forced into national borders and the African continent. And Ken Sero Riwa, uh, Ogoni land defender, writes so beautifully about this, that in virtually every nation state, he says, there are several Ogonis that are being subject to environmental and cultural destruction and mass poverty. Um, and just the last thing I would want to say about that is that black queer people, black radicals, black feminists, and uh, people who've often made outlaws, both within the patriarchal structure that home has been imposed on us and within the, the often patriarchal structure of family, I think, have have remarked in so many different ways on the insufficiency uh, of this and tried to dream more expansively for kinds of belonging that I think can teach us much more about what it could mean to coexist differently and to live together differently. So I think that where we end up landing in this text is not one 
container, but thinking about, that's why it's called, you know, 100 forms of home space, thinking about all the different kaleidoscopic ways we could reimagine our relationships to one another, to movement, to space, and again, to this idea that freedom to think with Ruth Wilson Gilmore is a place. I think in, in my letters to Robin, I wanted to make it very, very clear that I was profoundly not interested in recreating um, the nation state and the racial capitalism and heteropatriarchy that maintains it. And so sometimes I think in indigenous circles, when we're using terms like nationhood and self-determination and sovereignty, that those it's very easy for those terms and those practices to get tangled up in the settler state and in the meanings that racial capitalism inscribes on them. And so I liked what what uh, Moten was doing by refusing and then remaking these terms. But I felt like I wanted to be even more clear with what I was refusing. And I think in this book, what was really clear to me uh, over the process of engaging with, with you, Robin, is that this is a planetary crisis that, that we're in and that we've been in for the last 500 years. And it doesn't particularly matter what um, I'm thinking in my own little Anishinaabe area if it's not uh, deeply and intrinsically linked to all of the other anti-colonial uh, work that's going on in the world. And so I felt like this book was transformative for me in that I needed to scale up and I needed to think about resistance and I needed to think about how these systems are, are structuring my life and the conversations and the way that I'm relating to, um, to other movements. And so I think that um, I think that Robin and I could actually talk about this chapter for for hours and hours and hours. Um, and it is one of my, my most favorite spots in the book because I think that um, I just spent a lot of time and energy trying to think through how we are going to live together. How do we respect each other's self-determination? How do we respect each other's land-based politics and placemaking? And what am I willing to give up? There's old Anishinaabe teachings about um, you have to give up everything except, you know, what, what makes you Anishinaabe at your essence in order to promote the sanctity of the earth, in order to promote that, that larger relational system. And so I thought very long and hard about the politics and ethics of, of that section. Um. I think I was going to ask you to move to another section, but I want to dwell here a little bit longer because um, there's just so much going on in um, in in this idea of Leanne feeling ashamed of sharing, which is how the that clip of the letter begins. So I think so much, I think part of the reason why I was so drawn to this set of letters is that when I think about um, autonomy, dignity, and, and indeed self-possession, um, it feels like it heightens the vulnerability to move to the statement of, I will achieve that and move through that by giving up home, or home is the place where I, I allow just movement and sharing and maximum reciprocity. And that to me felt like, um, I don't like maybe asking, it, it, it is a leap, right? It, and it is a kind of leap of vulnerability. Maybe it's a recognition of the inter interdependence that already exists. I think that this book, one of the origin stories, there's a lot of different origin stories of this book, is an experience that Robin and I had in uh, Yellow Knives Dane territory, which is where I am right now, in the north, in, in Canada, in the Northwest Territories. And as part of my work at the Dechinta Center for Research and Learning, um, we 
organized a solidarity gathering where we invited a small group of, of Black, Brown, and Indigenous activists and community organizers and thinkers to the territory of the Yellow Knives Dene in March, which is, is still very much winter here, um, without really an agenda. And so we spent time snowmobiling together on the frozen lake. We set nets, we fished the nets, we hung out with elders, we shared moose ribs and muskox around the fire, and we got to know each other in a different formation. And that gathering was 100% um, based on Dene hospitality. It was Dene knowledge. Uh, hunting knowledge, fishing knowledge, knowledge of the land, Dene hospitality, a Dene ethic of sharing that enabled that gathering to take place in the way that it took place. And what we found was, what I found, is that we related to each other in a different way. We had different conversations. There was a different register. And there was also a lot of fun and a lot of connection and a lot of joy and a lot of laughing and uh, a lot of trust. Um, it's a pretty crazy thing to <laughs> invite um, invite folks to such uh, a, a remote place in the middle of winter. Um, so I think there was already a level of vulnerability and trust that was built into to this relationship. And when Robin wrote me that first letter, it was again this expression of, of connection, of reaching out, of vulnerability. And it wasn't meant for a book project. It wasn't, we didn't have a grant or, or a set of research questions or um, any other plan. Uh, then Robin wrote me a letter and I wanted to write her back with with the rigor and the specificity and the intelligence and the ethics that she had gifted gifted to me. Yeah, I thank you so much about what that means. Thinking about trust from the smallest sense of these these interconnections between two people becoming friends and what that means to sort of to take the risks as we move into the kind of world that that we are vast approaching of, you know, an enormous amount of loss and an enormous amount of risk, but an enormous amount of possibility. And I just I think I'll always have this memory of, you know, Leanne showing up at I think it was seven in the morning with, you know, a mug filled with hot coffee and taking off in these fur-lined canoes behind snowmobiles, going over the ice and just believing <laughs> that we weren't going to die as we go over this. These <laughs> ways of trying to relate to land have looked like for the different communities um, that we're thinking, speaking to. Small moments of, of trust and ability that you can actually reorient yourself in the world in relation to place and um, and community and communities, right? Um, I, I wanted to ask about some of your reflections on the current moment, because um, the letters in this book were written in moments of um, really intense opening of all kinds. Um, uh, a, a pandemic, which pandemics and wars and all of their awfulness do, can create portals to different kinds of realities. I think we saw part of that portal opening further or pride open um, during the revolts of summer 2020 and the, the glorious and sustained and global uprisings. Um, and I reread your book again just yesterday, um, quite honestly feeling like summer 22 2020 was quite far away from from where we are now um, and thinking about uh, a doubling down on policing on uh, law and order and war um, uh, domestically and abroad on campaigns to refund the police to increase criminal penalties for protesting near oil and gas pipelines um, more military spending the world over um, recommitment to, to dirty and extractive energy sources. Um, and I'm just, I'm wondering what it's like for you to hold the book in your hands as something now um, in this, in what I think of as, um, in some ways, it, uh, uh, I'll say, a 
politically, I think, actually a different moment from summer 2022. And I'm just wondering what it is that you want to hold on to from that moment or what lesson you want to draw forward um, or what you want to announce to people who are, are stretching towards each other now um, the way that you have done over the last two years. Absolutely. I often reflect on the fact that I'm actually so glad that, you know, we are writing the book from before the pandemic and then as it took place and it ends in the late fall of 2021. And if we hadn't sort of sent it and finished at that time, it would have been so tempting to go back because, you know, I remember this one a letter that I'm writing Leanne at, I think, four in the morning as there's a massive protest towards defunding the police happening in Toronto and some comrades had been arrested and were being detained. But it's really reflecting on this sense, despite it being a massive moment of repression of black movements uh, in Toronto, across Canada, of course, across the United States, it was also this moment of incredible possibility, right? When we saw statues of slavers being thrown into the sea, when we saw, you know, police, uh, office, uh, police headquarters burning and more of the public than one would expect being, you know, being, being uh, understanding the politics behind that, right? It was this incredible opening to the idea that, you know, as Walter Rodney says, another world is necessary, that I think it was so incredibly powerful to be writing through that moment. And it would be very difficult if I were still, for example, going through um, feeling like that um, and feeling, you know, experiencing that after we lived through, for example, the convoy protests where we saw the language of autonomy and bodily autonomy and sovereignty being used to push against vaccines, uh, you know, to threaten hospital workers, to threaten people in schools, uh, looking at the ways that things like blockades got refashioned and again used to sort of disrupt and push back very violently against this moment. So I think that our book in some ways, although it's not only reflecting on the present is in some ways an embodiment of a particular moment, as you say, in which the portal, uh, the, the portal perhaps felt closer. But what I think, what I really try to remember myself uh, now is that what happened at that time has still helped get many, many ready uh, people ready for the next act, right? So if we look not just to 2020, between 2020 and now, but even if we look to just five years before that, to the sort of first wave of the movement for Black Lives in this uh, generation's iteration, right? After the police killing of Trayvon Martin and others, at that time we saw demands, you know, more broadly for, you know, racial justice, for the idea that Black Lives Matter, but only just about five years later, we, we start to see demands that are not only saying that Black people deserve to live, that we need racial justice, but much more widely across society, not only that policing is harmful, but that we need to defund, dismantle, abolish police. And that is a massive, change in terms of what was possible on the cultural front uh, than what we had seen only five years before. And I don't think that we can underestimate what it meant for a generation of teenagers, for a generation of children, for a generation of many older people to, to begin to believe that we truly could build a world beyond police, beyond policing, beyond prisons, and that that has not gone away even if the media is not paying attention to it. So what I try to remember is what will the next wave of protests look like with the a massive amount of public education and political education that has happened in these recent years that has not been undone, even as, of course, the institutions are, as you, I think, really importantly highlight, uh, never did defund the police and, in fact, are massively expanding uh, carceral control, state surveillance and, you know, and the police and prison state. But I do think that the kinds of lessons that have been learned, the kind of networks that were created, um, what people saw they were capable of actually accomplishing, uh, that doesn't disappear over two years, right? So though I think that movements come in waves and we are not on the crest of a wave at this time very clearly, as a black person living in North America, I think I would say that I do feel that we know that the wave comes back up and we might be better positioned, at least in terms of politics, if definitely not systemically at this time. So I don't think that, though it is a moment where it's easy to despair, I don't. I think that there's there's still a lot to hang on to in terms of how much was actually cracked open and not taking for granted how much was cracked open, how much was actually radically breached at that time that, you know, we're seeing a response to filling those gaps, right? But I don't think that that's as, as sure as it, as it appears. And I don't think that it would be actually such a, a violent push back against the movement for black lives, against um, indigenous land reclamation movements if they hadn't done something incredibly successful and powerful. 
Yeah. I think world making is struggle. It's it's not easy work. It's very, very difficult work. And when I, I look at what my ancestors have been through, they were fierce. They were strong. They were persistent. They did not give up. They were strategic. They were smart. And all of that is why I am I'm even alive. And so when I start to feel despair and when I start to feel old and like everything is just getting worse, I try to to situate myself in that long history of struggle and know that I have to get up and that I have a responsibility to these coming generations and to the present to get up and do the work, whether I feel hopeful, whether I feel happy, whether I want to do the work or not. And I think one of the the things that that Robin was was just talking about is is sort of the cycling with this. Capitalism is not going to die an easy death. It's it's fierce, and we have to be fiercer. We have to be smarter, and we have to think outside of those formations in order to build a world where we can we can live, and where our families can live, and where we have a planet that's that's flourishing. And so I think that we can't be afraid of, of struggle and we can't be sort of um, thinking that that this is all going to to be an easy an easy rebirth. It's going to be very, very difficult because it's always been very, very difficult. But we have this responsibility to, that we inherited this struggle from from our peoples that um, that sacrificed everything so that we could get here. And so I think a lot about I think a lot about that. I think a lot about Idle No More and how you saw the state respond in Canada uh, with some divide and conquer tactics. You saw those divide and conquer tactics get amplified within the movement. You saw the movement fall apart. You see a right wing backlash and a white supremacist backlash. Um, and and that cycle starts starts again. And so I think one of the beautiful things for me about the past few years have been watching the brilliance of black radicals on the street um, doing the work that perhaps uh, indigenous folks in the moment felt too discouraged and too beat down to do. And so that's why I think this sort of constellation of co-resistance, this global network of co-resistance, taking these um, islands of, uh, of knowledge, sites of knowledge generation and, and starting to stitch them together um, to vision a place where we can, we can live. Um, is is interesting to me. I think it's um, something that for me is part of what can sustain the struggle. Thank you both for that. Thank you for um, sort of just reminding us that the struggle is long and hard and that there has been meaningful work done to sort of prepare us for the next act, so to speak. Um, and Leanne, you referenced um, movements deriving strength and inspiration from each other. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, the book as, you know, the book as such, and then also the book has been doing very well. Um, it, uh, it just made, uh, I think, fourth uh, number four on the on Canada's uh, bestseller list, and I think I maybe I just wanted to ask a, about um, I don't know maybe this is a funny question, but I'll say when I <laughs> when I first read this when I first read the book and I was I was thinking about how it might get sort of circulated and talked about and marketed. There was a part of me that felt very nervous that it would be positioned as a story of sort of hope and friendship between one indigenous rock star and one black rock star scholar activist and how they're, um, they're, they're becoming allies with each other was just so meaningful. And all of those words and the sort of commodification of um, identity in that way just sort of 
tweaked me preemptively. Um, and I, I just feel sort of curious if you if you feel that you've experienced any, I don't know, misreadings of the book or misreadings of you um, that you want to take this opportunity to, to publicly correct. I think um, this book is not two moms writing to each other during the pandemic, swapping recipes. Um, and I think the mainstream media in Canada has got a taste of, <laughs> of that this week from, from Robin and Leanne. And so I actually, I feel a little bit worried. I don't understand why it's on the bestseller list. I feel like we've maybe done something wrong. I don't know why the white people are buying the book. <laughs> um, and I, I definitely think that um, Robin and I, we're not rock stars and we don't have specialized knowledge. And I think we we tried really ethically to um, acknowledge and to affirm that our knowledge is coming from collective movement work and from thinking alongside and from reading widely. And it's, it's sort of a collective knowledge that's beyond me and beyond her. And so that's always really difficult to, I think, articulate um, when you release a book into the system of global capitalism. <laughs> and you you don't know what's going to happen but i think it also makes me really appreciative to to haymarket and to you and to having spaces where we can speak um and we can be who we are and uh and we can talk about what our hopes are for the book and that's not to change i don't think anybody and how they think but to acknowledge sort of the the massive number of black and indigenous people that are doing this work in our communities and to invite people to think alongside. Yeah, I would just add to that, that something that I always get worried about whenever I put out a piece of writing, but especially something like this, is the way that the media, uh, especially we have this really hyper individualized focus that likes to put forward the idea of there's these thought leaders who are somehow the ones <laughs> Who you know who come up with ideas about what freedom might mean, and that is as if it's as if it's specific people and individuals that are producing knowledge, and not uh, always these collective movements. So something that I think we were so intentional about when we were writing one another, and this is I think, uh, and as we thought through what we were what we were trying to do, you know, after the book was done, the, the way that we continued to sort of go back, at least I'll speak for myself, to make sure that it was ethically doing what I had hoped it to do was to never make you know. We're in there, I think, in a way. I'm in there in a way where I was trying to be vulnerable with uh, what it means to be, for example, parenting in a time of total uh, pandemic and climate co collapse and bring that vulnerability, I think. I was trying to uh, to move beyond this idea that there is a particular one way of knowing and that we have answers. But I think we we're also trying to, I was trying to amplify the collective labor that was happening all around us, the collective shoulders that we're standing on, you know, being so aware that there are movement elders who spent several decades incarcerated who know far more than me what black unfreedom looks like and also perhaps all the different freedom dreams that we can look back to that our ancestors have created of the different ways that people have tried to imagine what freedom could mean. So I see it as kind of a call and response of looking at this chorus of abolitionist struggle, of anti-colonial struggle, and trying to just sort of be, um, Andrea Ritchie often talks about our role as um, being stenographers, right? As movement stenographers, more than as being to try to, sort of, more than as trying to be these individual leaders, right? Of trying to really like think alongside and with, and that's something that it really felt uh, helpful for me, for me to try to do in the text uh, with within, I guess, the ethics of that writing, which I think comes from a kind of feminist tradition of not trying to be the one great man with the idea, but instead of thinking about, if we're going to think about freedom collectively, that we need to understand that ideas around Black freedom are produced collectively and has, have always been so. And the more we acknowledge that, um, I think the more we're able to think, to think more expansively beyond ourselves as well. So that's something that felt really important in the writing in the writing of it. And I think that at the same time, the media still always tries to, <laughs> will always try to put you back into that box and make you as if you're representative of the black community, right? And that's something that you can't totally control, but you can control as much as you can in the way that I think that you write and that you cite and that you, that you think. 
One thing I so appreciate about the book is the way that you're both so clear so consistently that there can be no liberation within capitalism. And I do, it's funny to think about, Leanne, your comment of, I, I wonder why all the white people are buying this book. Um, because the book really is not going to uh, create, uh, allow that wiggle room for someone who just wants like a little dose of liberal multiculturalism to get some diversity check marks and a little bit of a, 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 a language expansion for them. It's, it is so consistently woven throughout um, that your formations of, of nationhood and dignity mean an absolute refusal of capitalism. And I'm just so happy that um, every reader who gets the book is going to get a dose of that pretty much on every page. And on that note, I want to say something a little bit of a tangent, which I just want to give um, my warmest thanks to Haymarket Books, um, a radical, independent, and socialist publisher um, doing crucial work. I want to thank John McDonald, Anthony Arnove, Julie Fain, and other people who work to um, organize the book and this call. And I also just wanted to... Um, mention that um, Haymarket is one of the sponsors for a conference in Chicago um, coming up starting September 2nd. It's the Socialism Conference. Um, both Leanne and Robin will be there, as well as Robin D.G. Kelly, who wrote uh, the afterword for this book, as well as Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who wrote the foreword for this book. Um, as well as a, a number of other um, amazing organizations and people convening in Chicago at the Socialism Conference. And I um, really hope people on this call will consider um, uh, checking out the conference and, and coming if you can. Um, we have time for one question um, that I'm going to put forward to both of you. And then I, I wanted to ask maybe for each of you to read one more passage. Um, so the question from an audience member is, um, how do you think that abolitionists should respond to the backlash against defund and the growing media panic about so-called uh, rising crime and the like? I mean, I think that it is a really, it's a moment that in many ways was you know, if we didn't defund the police entirely in that moment, there are going to be a backlash. So I think in some ways, you know, we're living with, uh, again, the response to something that was incredibly powerful. The fact that the right is so horrified um, about the idea of defunding tells us uh, that, that we're on to something, right? The idea that, um, you know, I had this moment that felt so surreal in 2020 when I was on national news pointing at this graph about where funding from police could go. <laughs> Uh, if not to the police of where else it could go in terms of housing and all of these other things, right? So I think that was something that was sort of an existential uh, concern. Then, of course, we're experiencing that backlash. So I think that what we need to do is what we have we have always continued to do outside of these large flashpoints when the media is looking. It's not as if, you know, organizers are, are always continuously working, working on public education. I think debunking the idea that uh, crime even exists um, as a kind of category, I think is really crucial. If we de if we separate, as Maryam Kaba always invites us to do, and many others, the difference between crime and harm, then we can look at the global context in which harms against human beings being enacted by the carceral state are on the rise. Again, as always, in which harms against the environment are set to increase literally daily as we go on, and to really commit ourselves again every single day right to ending harm whether that's against uh, whether that's harm against the environment whether that's harm against our community members and to just really continue that struggle and to not let ourselves get distracted um by the way that you know the media is trying to reconvince us to be afraid to reconvince us to be afraid of one another and to reconvince us to be afraid of our communities uh and that and try to and try to make us believe that the only response to that fear is uh can be police so I think it's about refusing that narrative and remembering what we do need to genuinely be concerned about and just strengthening the resolve not to, as I teach my son who's six, um, let the people who are trying to destroy uh, the planet um, and, and the people trying to protect it, to let those people win, right? But to actually say that now is a time to really triple down and again, get ready for what the next act might bring. 
uh, for all of us and to and to be ready to take some rest, but at the same time to really continue to do that work that um, something like 2020 and those protests can only happen and the ways in which those those demands were formulated and spread so widely can only happen because of background work that groups like Critical Resistance and many others have been doing for generations, right? So to remember that the quiet parts are actually really crucial parts because that's building the foundations that make it possible to, to really bring forward these more widespread challenges. So to keep chipping away at that foundation, I think, and not be afraid to take, and not be afraid to take risks because we see enormous risks um, and really egregious acts being committed by the right, by vigilantes, and we need to be organized in response, in response to that. Leanne, do you want to comment on that? I have nothing to add. I think that um, Robin, Robin has, has done a beautiful job of answering that. Um, I, I wanted to close by asking you to read a little bit from the final letters. Um, and Leanne, I was hoping that you could um, start us off um, with what I, was just one of the most beautiful passages in the book about cilia. Um, this is starting on page 242. I agree that that is one of the most beautiful passages, but Robin wrote this, the part on cilia. Awesome. During my 20s, as I went back and forth between smoking and not smoking, I'm still going back and forth between smoking and not smoking, I used to keep a photo of a cluster of cilia magnified in close range on my phone. It served as, a, as an anti-smoking aid, albeit an unconventional one. The respiratory cilia allow us, under normal conditions, to breathe clearly. They are the tiny, tentacle-like structures, 1,000 times smaller than a human hair, that cover our respiratory tract. They are in constant motion, and when they are working as they should, they propel mucus cephalid at 4 to 20 millimeters per minute. They move synchronously, 15 cycles every second. They are bathed in water-like fluid, and as the mucus layer on top of them traps debris, their rhythmic movements thrust it forward, away from the places where it could do damage. And from a visual perspective, the respiratory cilia are stunning. This is what first drew me in. I would close my eyes and visualize this movement that is constantly taking place in my body, so essential to my health and survival, yet outside of my conscious awareness or control. How could one knowingly damage something this beautiful, this essential? There are times when I forget to connect otherwise with the fact that I inhabit a body, that I am not separate from my own flesh. Yet through my desire to protect the respiratory cilia in all of their complexity and fragility, I discovered a renewed ability to connect, to reconnect with the corporeal sides of life, if vicariously, and thus began to examine what it meant to care for myself. This reconnection is fleeting. Care for the self remains an ongoing struggle, but it matters. It's a choice that needs to be made and remade. The first time that I opened Tony K. Bambara's The Salt Eaters, I experienced her words like a line of bullets that had been molded specifically for the soft places inside of me as I read the first line of the book. Are you sure, sweetheart, that you really want to be well? There is something in the words, however gentle the phrasing of the question, that forces an exposure of one's relationship to oneself. Thank you for that. And Leanne, I was hoping that you could read um, from the final letter, um, starting with, in my language, the word for November. In my language, the word for November is based on the word and it freezes over referencing the time when the lake freezes over. For me, this has become a time to think about the apocalypse of climate change because our lakes don't freeze over now until January, if we're lucky. The ice road that used to go across Rice Lake is no more. The clear, dense ice, the kind that forms before snow comes, is something I've only seen in Danende. We know that the violence of racial capitalism has hurt Gabi Boon 
winter maker, the spirit and being responsible for the cold, and that they are struggling and suffering right now and out of balance with Nibin, the summer, and Zhawanong, the south wind, the spirits that bring us summer, light and warmth. November is also the time where I wish and yearn for the brightness of snow to break the gray monotony of the month. I like snow because it makes visible another power of water, starting out as a single nucleus of desert dust falling 3.5 feet per second and folding one crystal at a time, forming a nation of stunning difference, propagating arms of crystal offering the full spectrum of possibility, reflecting the full spectrum of light. I like the idea of one molecule practicing world making, combining with other molecules, falling in formation with others until the world is blanketed with snow carrying light and the world is transformed to our winter lodge. I like the idea of those same molecules reaching your cilia. Nibi insists on internationalism. Nibi, or water, insists on us seeing ourselves outside of our own perspectives. Well, the work we've done together in this book has focused on Black and Indigenous relationality. Nibi reminds me that radical imaginings and world buildings must be international in orientation, reaching beyond Canada, beyond North America, and beyond the Atlantic not as an afterthought at the height of mobilizations, but as a foundational practice. This, of course, is something that the Black radical tradition, Black feminists, and Indigenous liberation collectives have been doing for decades. I'm reminded of the delegation of Indigenous, Black, and women of color feminist scholars who visited the West Bank in 2011. They were shocked by the quotidian violence of the occupation and upon their return committed to the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement and to strengthening relations between their own organizations and circles of influence and the freedom fighters they had met in Palestine. Dakota scholar, activist and writer Wazi Atewin was part of that delegation and she writes, sometimes it takes seeing the suffering of others to realize the full magnitude of our own suffering. As a Dakota woman in Palestine, I had the painful experience of witnessing the monstrous destructiveness of settler colonialism's war against a people and a land base. I told one friend that it was like witnessing a high speed and high tech version of the colonization of our indigenous homelands. Both Davis and Wazia Tween write about their knowledge of self, indigenous anti-colonial movements and abolition deepening through their experiences with Palestinian resistance. More recently, Stephen Salaita has argued for Palestinian struggles to take up a more central position in critical indigenous studies by laying the conceptual groundwork to link our struggles through settler colonialism, state violence, occupation, and indigeneity. In indigenous mobilizations in Canada, it is common to see Palestinian solidarity most recently with local Palestinian support of 1492 Land Back Lane and the support of the BDS movement for the Wet'suwet'en mobilization. Smaller grassroots organizations, including Families of Sisters in Spirit, a volunteer collective of family members of murdered and missing indigenous women, have issued solidarity statements for Palestinian freedom. These families know that freedom is a place as Ruth Wilson Gilmore says, and that placemaking is a global practice. Wow. Leanne and Robin, thank you both so much for um, joining for this beautiful reading tonight. Thank you for rehearsals for living that I hold in my hands. Um, and I feel so proud and happy um, that it's in the world. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. And I hope very much um, that we can all reconvene together um, in September at the Socialism Conference in Chicago.
Good night. Thank you.